Atlantis Houston to our favorite crew. Good morning. Hey, my favorite crew says good morning back. Thanks a lot for the wake up and thanks for Allison for the song and the dedication. Brent, we're uh, looking at both of you there on the flight deck, and it's uh, at your discretion. Okay, if it's okay, we'll bring them on now. We can power them down and then uh, de cream and power them back up, but if we're not going to take any more data, it just it doesn't seem necessary. Roger, we copy. We're looking at the, at the GPS. A little bit more information overload. The disk is tw has 26.5 megabytes available on 700-14. Okay, we copy. We're, ju we're just puzzling over your call and uh, wanted to make sure that we're configured properly for the GPS INS troubleshoot procedure that's timelined a little before 2300. Yeah, I'll bring, um, bring 700-12 back up. I guess I'm Hello, uh, Terry, Chris, how are you all doing? Over in the chamber, this is John Baja. We have you loud and clear, John. Thanks for the call. We also can see you on the monitor in front of us. You asked me uh, what did I think about the, how did that go with the BTS and the cartilage. Is that correct? Yes, I copy that, John. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'll tell you what, uh, I think that experiment in a broad uh, context uh, really shows the value of long-duration space flight. Uh, well, let me explain. Uh, the people on the ground had done a fantastic job designing it and everything, and uh, had we tested it on the shuttle, uh, we would have flown a, a two- or three-week flight, and we would have landed and thought everything was uh, just uh, great. As it turns out, about four weeks into the flight, uh, the air that had been uh, processing, when we mix media in the bag, there was no air, and in the, in there was special water that I had brought up. And when I mixed that water with the media, just like, and then I noticed all fluids do it in space, uh, it just seems to create bubbles. And over a, a period of uh, four weeks, it took that long for the bubbles to propagate through the whole system and finally get into the vessel. And when I saw the bubbles first in the vessel, uh, I, I was really alarmed, and, of course, everybody on the ground was. But then the people on the ground, as usual, came up with all sorts of procedures. And then we opened up the box and tried to evaluate the system. And uh, the bottom line is uh, we ended up having to manually feed the uh, flesh media. And then we'd make our uh, samples at the end of a period, right before we I mixed a new bag, and, uh, uh, we, and so we could tell the health of the media. So, uh, no, that was a very uh, good experiment. As it turns out, I think it was very successful, and the cartilage uh, continued to grow, you know, as cartilage from a cow's knee. And, uh, but we just had to get the human being involved. 
as it turns out, I know it wasn't intended, showed the value of long-duration space flight as well as human involvement. Okay, John, this is Fred Smith again. Uh, again, I'd like to echo congratulations to you. Uh, my question is dealing uh, more with on the psychological uh, aspects of uh, long duration. Uh, we're, we're also doing some evaluation, uh, psychological evaluations for our uh, tests here. I was wondering, were there any some things that you found helpful in uh, making your stay more enjoyable for your for the duration of your mission on Mir? Yes, I understand. You know, you're talking about something now that I think is uh, crucial uh, to a uh, long-duration flight, be it a flight uh, on a space station with an international crew, and I stress that, international crew, or a, uh, a flight to Mars with an international crew. Uh, when you put people together who are from different cultures, cultures and uh, who have different uh, a language as their primary language, uh, you even add to the psychological problem, for example, the four of you uh, will or will not experience there in your laboratory on the ground. And in fact, I think you could think of next time you do something like this, try and put uh, some people from different nationalities together and uh, who maybe don't speak the common language real well. Uh, because that introduces, I think, another element of psychological uh, pressure and stress. Uh, and in my case, uh, I had trained with two Russian cosmonaut crews uh, in Star City for a year and a half, and then unfortunately, a week before their launch, uh, one of the people had a heart problem. Uh, fortunately, it's not bad, and, and he's happy now, but uh, so they had to change the crew. So I flew with a completely different two Russians than I had even trained with, which even added more to, I think, uh, some stress in the first uh, month of the flight. So, but you're on to something that's very, very important. Uh, uh, but I think there are many parameters, and we really need to think about it in the future with our International Space Station. For example, if we have two Americans, two Russians, uh, uh, a European, and a, uh, a, a person from, say, Japan, uh, the people who are a alone by themselves and don't have a friend from their own culture, I think are going to even have a little more special kind of problem that we need to pay attention to. Yes, I was wondering if, if you had any uh, experiences or interactions with the, with the Mir uh, life support systems uh, that you'd like to share with us. Uh. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you're right on it. Those life support systems, they're very important. and. Uh, and what, I, I would say a couple of things on that that I noticed working with my two Russian colleagues, Valerie and Sasha. First of all, uh, the crew probably needs to know those systems at a deeper level than I remember I knew the ecosystems here on the shuttle. Uh, when you're able to clean a vehicle up on the ground as we do and then go into orbit and stay for two weeks and come home and clean it up again, that's one kind of level of knowledge. Uh, if you're going to go up there on our new space station, uh, uh, you need to go to a deeper level of knowledge. And uh, we need to make sure we have a couple of people trained on that new International Space Station uh, uh, into that deeper level of knowledge. Because uh, when something goes wrong, maybe the spare part isn't there. But if you have people who are trained to go into the boxes and, and take a small component out that's broken and actually fix it, and then put it back in the box. Uh, that's the type of training we're going to have to do, and I saw a lot of that during my flight uh, on Mir. Houston, let us for a transfer. Go ahead, John. John Baja brought with him some MCDs that needed to be refrigerated and we put them in PTCU-1, which is a five degree C container. Uh, they're not supposed to be frozen, so we didn't put them in Leslie. We just want to make sure that you and the BioRack folks know that that's where they are. We see them and concur, thanks. Thanks.
Houston for CMRF. We have a question. Do you want all of our little data runs here with only one CMO, or are we allowed to use two people to restrain the patient? Marcia, we'd like to use two if possible. Okay. Okay, the first one Brent did uh, was, of course, a record time of 55 seconds of getting John restrained, and now we'll do it with two. Lannis Houston, very impressive. We're one minute to the ZOE. We'll pick you up at 22.33. 